in Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning in verse number 11, Moses has this to say to the children of God in the wilderness. For this commandment which I give and command you today... For this commandment which I command you today, it is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Today, today is a critical point in our lives. It was certainly a critical point in the lives of God's people in the wilderness. The setting of the book of Deuteronomy is one that comes towards the end of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and it comes right before that period of time in which God's people go into the the promised land of Canaan to conquer it and to inherit that land flowing with milk and honey. The entire book book of Deuteronomy is basically set in a in a one month time frame right as God's people are on the verge of do, of doing one of the biggest things that had ever been known in history of that time and that is to inherit the promised land of Canaan. The, Moses has been setting the people up all along as he's been writing and and this book Deuteronomy it's translated the second law. Now really it's It's not a new law, but rather a renewal of the law, a renewal of the covenant that God originally gave to his people. In the first four chapters in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is basically preaching and teaching to the people about what God has done in the past. In chapters 5 through 26, it's a rather long sermon that Moses delivers in which he basically lays out what God expects out of his people. In the last several chapters of the book, from chapters 27 through 34, Moses is encouraging the people and teaching them of what the Lord will do in the future for them. What I love about our text this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 20, is that Moses captures all three of these dynamics in this one sermonette. He's encouraging them about what God has done in the past. He's expecting and teaching them what to they got what God expects in the present and he's showing them what God is going to do for them in the future today today is a critical point in our lives the Seattle Seahawks figured out that they were in a very critical point in their lives last Sunday, and, and they were right there near the one-yard line, and they had the best running back in the league sitting there with more than one timeout, but they throw the ball, and that decision cost them the Super Bowl. On a more serious note, this past week, King Abdullah over in the land of Jordan, he figures that his people are at such a critical point in their lives that he is ready to pursue the group ISIS until his military runs out of fuel and bullets. Now, none of us are in those particular situations, but all of us today are facing critical points in our lives. Some of you are debating your marriage at this moment. You're trying to figure out what you want to do next in your family with your spouse and with your children. Some people are in a critical point in their lives when it comes to their careers. And it may be the young adult who is on the verge of a new adventure trying to figure out what is next in my life. Or it may simply be others at a critical point in their life where they are entering a a new phase of life where they've never been and are facing challenges such as health and financial and family concerns. Today is a critical point in 
our lives. And all of us need to understand that today, from a spiritual perspective, this is the most critical time of our lives. In fact, the only time that we do have is now and in the present. And so all of us need to consider our relationship with God. As we've said over the last few Sundays, we know that several of you are thinking about becoming Christians. You're studying the Bible. You're attending worship on a regular basis. You're asking questions. And, and we know that you are thinking about putting your feet faith in Jesus Christ by repenting of sins and confessing faith and, and being baptized into Christ. And we want you to know we are here for you. And as you are looking at this critical decision, this choice in your life, we want to help you and guide you in God's word as you make that decision. Others are at a critical point in their lives with God because they know they've been Christians and they now realize that they have fallen away and, and you might be trying to come back to the Lord to get back into the ways of righteousness, to repent of sins, to be restored to the Lord. In that regard, today is a critical point in your life. Later, in this, after God's people end up conquering the land of Canaan, Joshua reflects upon all that God has done and, and his commitment and understanding that he was at a critical point in his life. And he's challenging God's people in Joshua 24, verse 14, to now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods of your fathers who were served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day, today, whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers who were served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in which land you now dwell. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Today is a critical point in each of our lives. As we're facing big decisions about life, and as we're facing big decisions about eternal life as well. As we continue in our text this morning, and as we are all making a decision this morning to choose life, we must, number one, keep his words near. Notice verse number 14 of Deuteronomy chapter 30. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. Now, God's people during that time did not have his word as readily accessible as we do. In fact, there was only certain aspects of the year in which God's people were able to be fully exposed to his word. And putting that into context and understanding how accessible the Bible is to us in our lives today is a quite a remarkable thing to think about. I've been reflecting upon all of the Bible. Bibles that I have in my life. I think about my office right over down the hallway here. I have at least 10 different Bibles and many different translations. I also think about the, the blue letter Bible that I like to use on my iPad to, to study God's Word. I, I think about the Bible app that I carry around in my pocket every single day. And I think about the Bible that's sitting on the, st uh, the, the stand area in our living room, and also the Bible that's sitting on my nightstand right next to my bed. And I know you have several Bibles around as well. But there's a big difference between having the Word of God in your pocket and having the Word of God in your heart. There, there's an entirely, it's a big, big difference between having the Word of God on your nightstand and having the Word of God on your mouth. We need to not only have access to God's Word, which we are very thankful that we do, but we need to have this Bible, God's Word, open 
We need to read from it. We need to study from it. And we need to search the Scriptures daily. I'm mindful of a couple of verses in Scripture. In Psalm 119, 105, for example, the Bible says that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a guide or a light to my path. I'm also mindful of what the Apostle Paul says over in Romans chapter 10, verse number 8 and following. He's reflecting upon some things that are said out of here in Deuteronomy 30. He actually quotes verse number 14. And Paul says, but what does it say? Romans 10 verse 8. The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, there's a lot of people in our world around us that are claiming salvation but have never opened the Word of God. There's a lot of folks around us who confess their belief in Jesus Christ and that they say that Jesus is in their heart. Yet they are very distant from the Word of God. Notice in this passage, and this is a theme that occurs throughout Scripture, is that the Word of God is directly connected to our confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and the Word of God is directly connected to our belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, And with all of that said, the Word of God is directly connected to our salvation. We cannot know what God wants us to do if we don't open His Word and read it and study. We've got to keep the Word of God near to us in our hearts and on our mouths as well. Secondly, this morning, as we choose life, we must keep His Word near, and we must also walk in His ways. Look at verses 15 and 16 of our text this morning. See, I have set before you today, there's that critical point in our lives again, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you are about to possess. That's what God is teaching them about what He will do in the future. Well, what they have to do in the present is to walk in his ways. Now, some people have a very, very difficult time walking in the ways of the Lord. I don't know if it's because of selfishness. I don't know if it's because of stubbornness or maybe even arrogance, but some people feel as if they always have to have their way. It's either my way or the highway. It's how I want to do it or there's no other way that it can be done. Earlier in the week I was reading an an article written by a, a lady named Lynn Napka, and her essay is titled... The I need to be right way of thinking. And this particular writer says that one one of life's biggest setups for being lonely is living with the erroneous belief that your way is the best way of doing things and insisting that others always agree with your way. Some people seem to have taken a life course called How to Be Absolutely Sure of Everything. It's like their reality testing mechanism is stuck on It's So Because I Think It's So. 
People who feel constantly threatened and angry when others question their actions substitute being right for living a happy life. The author goes on to say, wanting and insisting on getting your way is a setup for unhappiness. Being rigid in thinking leads to power struggles or submission from others and distancing. People who are prone to anger, this writer says, have a set pattern of beliefs, attitudes, expectations, and behaviors that insist on getting their own way. They believe that there is a certain way that others should act and become angry when their expectations are not met. They need to be seen as good, innocent, and superior in their knowledge and how things should be done. They may use charm or anger or intimidation to get their way. But what happens when our way goes against God's way? What happens when something that we've been doing for a long time because we've always thought it to be the right way is in contradiction to what Scripture says? Are we going to have enough humility? Are we going to have enough selflessness to put our ways that we've always thought were right on the side as we consider what the Word of God truly says in regards to doctrine, as far as the plan of salvation, as far as the Lord's church, as far as how we live our lives in in faithfulness to God and in service to others. In fact, Scripture says elsewhere in Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 12, that there's, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We want to walk in righteousness. As 1 John chapter 1, verse number says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from our and from all our sin. As we choose life, we must, number one, keep His Word near. Number two, walk in His ways. And three, we need to worship only God. Notice verse 17 and 18 of our text in Deuteronomy chapter 30. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. This is getting back to what Joshua was encouraging the people uh, during his day. I announce to you, verse 18, today, there's that critical point in our lives again, that I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. We talked a couple of weeks ago here at, at Hickory Knoll about the various pagan gods uh, in our society that many people pursue after. And I realize, and I'm sure I'm saying this again with Mardi Gras right around the corner, it bears mentioning again that we need to be mindful of potential sinfulness, immorality, and debauchery of pursuing these pagan gods in our lives, having to do with pleasure and having to do with immorality and having to do with everything that is unrighteous. Don't wait till the day after Mardi Gras to get your life right with God. Make it right today. Because this passage says here that it may very well be the case that today may be our last breath. Today may be the day in which we perish. Today is the critical point in our lives. As I've shared several times over the last few weeks, I've been having a lot of fun coaching five- and six-year-old basketball, but I'm going to tell you we've got one one game left, and it has been very, very stressful. In fact, the idea of writing a second Ph.D. dissertation is currently a whole lot less painful than coaching our last game on Tuesday nights. Because in basketball, five- and six-year-olds, it's not just with this age, but others, I'm sure, we had one little fellow who quit 
We have others that don't show up. We have others who are tired, and most of which are not focused at all on what is going on. I have a whole lot more respect for elementary grade teachers, but I realize that some people, they treat worship in the same way that five- and six-year-olds treat basketball. Some want to quit. Some don't ever show up. Some don't, you don't know if they're going to show up or not. Others show up tired. Others simply are not focused. But we want to worship, and we want to worship only our God. As we think about the five acts of worship, which is the one that you need to focus more on while we gather together and while we assemble? It, it may be that the singing is something that you know that you have, ha, your heart is not into the songs for whatever reason. It may be the case that when we're praying, you decide for whatever reason not to pray. It may be the case when the sermon comes out that there is a tuning out of what is said. It may be the case that the Lord's Supper is is something in which you think about a bunch of other things besides the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Or it may be the case that your giving is one in which you know you can prepare more and you know you can be more of a cheerful giver, but it's that part of worship that is distracting you. We want to worship God and we want to worship Him alone. In John chapter 4 verse number 24, scripture says that God is spirit. These are the words of Christ, by the way. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And of course, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 and 25, we are encouraged to consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of the saints or ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. As we choose life, we must keep his word near. We must walk in his ways. We must worship only God. As we begin to conclude this morning... Is Jesus your life? We finished our text in verses 19 and 20 of Deuteronomy chapter 30. In which Moses writes, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today. There's that critical point in our lives again. Against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Therefore, choose life. That both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life. For he is your life and the length of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Is Jesus your life? We have a choice to make. Deuteronomy concludes in the other chapters of showing us the blessings and cursings that come as a result of choosing faithfulness. That, of course, results in blessings. But if we choose death or if we choose unrighteousness, that's going to result in cursings as well. And we don't want to be deceived by Satan or the evil one because we know what Jesus says in John verse 10 verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have that life more abundantly. Jesus desires for you to choose life. Is Jesus your life? 
In Colossians chapter 3, as Paul is encouraging us in verse 2 to set our minds on things above and not on things on the earth, in verse number 4, he says, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. As Christians, Jesus is our life. He is our all. He is our everything. We worship Him and Him alone. We keep His Word near to our hearts and to our mouths. And we worship and we walk in His ways. A choice is set before you now. Living or dying, blessing or cursing... You know the time has come around to turn from your fighting and rest in His mercy. Choose life that you might live. The life that He gives, He gives you forever. Choose life the way that it's true from the one who chose you, your Father in heaven. Choose life. This morning, it is our hope and our prayer that each of you choose life, that you choose Jesus, that you will surrender your life to Him and do what He says to do as far as becoming a Christian and as far as living a faithful Christian life. Let's all choose life this morning. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, will you do so right now while together we stand and sing?